This chapter will focus on diseases that affect our skin and eyes. Our skin has a pretty good defense system to protect us from pathogens. Our integuments include skin, hair, nails, and glands. The skin is considered the largest organ in the body, taking up up to two square meters of surface area. Our stratum corneum is the most superficial protection, and with shedding of dead cells in this layer, so also are microbes shed. Keratin, which is part of our epidermis, also has a protective mechanism. It can help protect from damage, abrasion, and penetration of water. In addition to layers of our skin serving as defense mechanisms, we also have antimicrobial peptides that target microbes and keep their numbers on our skin low. Sebum, which is released from our sebaceous glands, has a low pH, which hinders the growth of most microbes. The lipids are used by our normal flora, and the byproducts of metabolism prevent the growth of potentially pathogenic microbes. Sweat is also acidic and salty, which prevents the growth of microbes. Lysozyme, found in our sweat, tears, and saliva, can break down the cell walls of bacteria. In order for a microbe to survive on our skin, it must withstand dry and salty environments. The majority of our normal flora on our skin can be found in moist environments, like the underarms and groin. Some normal biota that we could find include Staphylococcus, Pseudomonas, and Candida. The Human Microbiome Project identified hundreds of different species of microbes. We all differ in the types of species we have, but our normal microbiota will remain relatively constant. Let's look at MRSA, or Methicillin-Resistant Staph aureus. It's a cause of skin lesions and is multidrug re resistant. In some cases, S. aureus is the causative agent that is part of the normal flora in roughly 33% of the population. It can withstand salty and acidic environments. It can also resist typical disinfectants. Some signs and symptoms we see associated with MRSA include elevated red tender lesions. Oftentimes, pus is seen along with warm to the touch. A fever is often common. MRSA can be transmitted through direct and indirect contact with items like gym equipment, as well as contact with the lesion. S. aureus is notorious for producing various virulence factors that enable it to clot plasma and break down nucleic acids and lipids. MRSA can be diagnosed using PCR, mannitol salt auger, as well as the catalase and coagulase test. It can be prevented with good hygiene and is treated with pus drainage and antibiotics. Let's discuss maculopapular rash diseases that can be caused by various microbes and involves flat to slightly raised colored bumps. Measles is caused by the measles virus. Even though we have a vaccine for this disease, about 367 children die each day. Prior to the vaccine, measles killed 6 million people a year. Of course, anti-vaccination campaigns have contributed to the virus still being prevalent. Some signs and symptoms include a sore throat, headache, fever, and characteristic coplic spots in the mouth. We can't forget about the rash that starts on the head and then works its way down. In a small amount of cases, complications like laryngitis and bacterial infections may arise. There may also be swelling of the brain. The most severe consequence of measles is subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. In this case, there is degeneration of the brain. It's rare, occurring in one in less than 1,000 children who are infected with measles before receiving the vaccine. The child experiences neurological impairment and within a matter of months or years, death. 
This situation occurs years after the child was infected with measles. The virus attaches to the respiratory mucosa and then travels to the lymphatic system, followed by the bloodstream. The mode of transmission is through droplet contact. A person is contagious prior to exhibiting the rash or other symptoms. It can be diagnosed in the clinical setting or via an ELISA. Measles can be prevented with the MMR vaccine and can be treated via supportive therapy. Rubella, also known as German measles, causes a minor rash or can severely damage the fetus during a pregnancy. Women who plan on or have a chance of getting pregnant should be vaccinated. Postnatal rubella has a rash that starts off in the face and then works its way down. It's typically resolved in a few days. Adults may have joint pain instead of a rash. Congenital rubella is passed to the fetus. The virus is teratogenic and if it is transmitted during the first trimester, it can lead to miscarriage or defects. The most common sign is deafness but other symptoms may also be effective. affected. The causative agent is the rubivirus. This virus can halt mitosis and induce apoptosis, which is why it is so harmful and potentially deadly to the fetus. It can be transmitted via respiratory droplets. The virus is shed in the prodromal stage where the earliest of symptoms appear. This virus is typically spread by people living in close quarters. In 2004, the U.S. eliminated the virus. Rubella can be diagnosed by an ELISA and can be prevented with the MMR vaccine. Postnatal rubella only requires symptomatic treatment while there is no treatment for congenital rubella. Fifth disease is also known as erythema infectiosum. It's the fifth disease identified that causes rashes in children. This disease pre presents itself as a slapped cheek appearance. The rash then spreads to the rest of the body and may reoccur for weeks. The causative agent of fifth disease is the parvovirus B19. It can be diagnosed in the clinic with the characteristic rash or by testing for antibodies to rule out rubella. The mode of transmission is via droplet contact and direct contact. There is no vaccine or treatment. Roseola is another disease typically seen in young children and infants. A rash is sometimes seen, but up to 70% of patients don't exhibit a rash. A high fever is seen, followed by a rash on the chest and trunk. The causative agent of roseola is HHV6, which may remain latent after a patient clears the virus. The mode of transmission is unknown, and it's believed that all of us have had the virus by the time we are adults. There's no treatment or prevention. Impetigo is caused by a bacteria that causes the skin to peel or flake. It can be caused by either Staph aureus or Strep pyogenes or both. Most of the time, Strep pyogenes starts it. Impetigo patients present with honey-colored crust or flaky scabs. Typically, the lesions are seen in the mouth, face, as well as the extremities. If Staph aureus causes impetigo, its toxins cause the blistering and help the bacteria to spread. If impetigo is caused by strep pyogenes, other conditions may arise. Strep pyogenes is also the causative agent of other infections. In rare instances, strep pyogenes can lead to kidney damage after the impetigo infection. It's the most common causative agent of impetigo in newborns, while Staph aureus causes infections in adults and children. However, both bacteria can affect any age group. Both of the organisms are transmitted via direct and indirect contact. 
Good hygiene helps to prevent impetigo and can be treated with antibiotics. Cellulitis is an infection in the dermis and cutaneous layer, subcutaneous layer. The patient will exhibit pain, swelling, and warm skin. Lymphangitis, which are red lines leading away from the area, is the microbe and inflammatory products traveling. In healthy individuals, Staph aureus or Strep pyogenes are the causative agents, while any bacterium and some fungi can infect immunocompromised individuals. Infants can be infected with Group B Streptococci. The mode of transmission is the parenteral route, where bacteria or fungi enter via trauma or accidentally. Cellulitis can be diagnosed by signs and symptoms and can be treated with oral or IV antibiotics. In severe cases, surgical debridement may be necessary. Staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome is caused by staph aureus and mostly affects newborns and babies. Lesions appear around the umbilical cord or diaper or armpit area. The layers then split. The toxins that S. aureus produce lead to a burned appearance. The skin then sloths off. This disease can be transmitted by direct contact with caregivers. It can also be transmitted by droplet contact. It can be diagnosed by signs and symptoms. It can be prevented by removing individuals who harbor staff from the nurseries and can be treated with antibiotics. Next, we will discuss chickenpox and smallpox, which are viral diseases that start off as rashes and then fluid-filled lesions called pox appear. A patient with chickenpox has a fever and rash after up to a three-week incubation period. The rash begins in the upper extremities. Lesions then form from the flat rash. They're filled with fluid and are extremely itchy. Eventually, they encrust and heal. Typically, more lesions are seen in the center of the body. Chicken pox can last a week with new lesions not appearing after five days. In rare instances, encephalopathy occurs and can be fatal. Shingles involves the virus associated with chickenpox. After getting over chickenpox, the virus enters nerve endings and becomes latent. Stress or immunosuppressive drugs may reactivate the virus, which then emerges along the nerve endings. Shingles patients exhibit tender vesicles and pain along the nerve endings. If the cranial nerves are affected, eye inflammation and ocular and facial paralysis may be seen. HHV3 or varicella is the causative agent of chicken pox and shingles. The virus first enters the respiratory tract, then the bloodstream. The virus then enters the skin and nerve endings. The mode of transmission is droplet contact and inhalation of aerosolized fluid from lesions. Patients are infectious prior to developing the rash. They can be prevented by a vaccine and involves methods to alleviate and treatment involves symptoms to alleviate the methods, excuse me, to alleviate the symptoms. If secondary bacterial infections arise, antibiotics may be administered. In some instances, a cyclovir may be given. Aspirin may lead to Ray's syndrome, which can lead to coma and death. Smallpox is a disease that luckily we don't have to worry about. It has been eradicated or eliminated. Signs and symptoms of smallpox involve fever, fatigue, and a rash that starts off in the throat and then spreads. It works its way from a macular rash to a pustular one. On the right is characteristic scar of a smallpox lesion. The etiological agent of smallpox is the variola major virus. 
Patients may also experience abdominal and back pain, and within 24 hours, the rash spreads. Should a case be seen, it would be treated as a huge emergency. After four days, the bumps increase in size and begin to fill with the liquid. They then start to scab over, but the patient is still contagious until that last scab falls. Variola minor causes a mild rash compared to variola major. The mode of transmission for smallpox is through droplet contact and indirect contact with fomites. In the 1970s, it was endemic in 31 countries, which led to an eradica eradication effort, which was successful in 1977. Smallpox can be prevented by post-exposure prophylaxis, and there's no treatment. Leishmaniasis is an infection that targets the capillaries of the skin in the, cutane in the cutaneous form. It may also affect the skin and mucous membranes and can lead to a systemic infection. The causative agents are organisms from the Leishmania genus. The mode of transmission is through the bite of a sand flat. It can be diagnosed by microscopic means. There's no vaccine, and avoiding the fly with nets or sprays is the only prevention. Cutaneous anthrax causes a papule on the skin that eventually dies and ruptures. It then forms a black piece of dead tissue, or eschar. Bacillus anthracis, a bacterium, is a causative agent. The mode of transmission is by direct contact with endospores. This can occur by cuts or abrasions. This form of anthrax can be identified by culturing it on blood auger, serological means, or PCR. Ciprofloxacin and other antibiotics can treat it, but if untreated, it can be fatal 20% of the time. Vaccines are available for high-risk individuals as well as the military. Dermatophytes are fungi that cause a wide variety of infections. All of the infections begin with, the, with tenia because it was originally believed that they were caused by worms. Ringworm can be seen on the scalp, beard, on the body, groin, feet, and nails, as you can see here. There are a few causative agents of ringworm. They include trichophytin, microsporum, and epidermophytin. These dermatophytes can digest or break down keratin. The mode of transmission is via direct or indirect contact with infected humans or animals. Antifungal ointments are the treatment options. Superficial mycoses only involve the outer epidermis. They're more of a harmless cosmetic issue rather than a disease. Most individuals exhibit mild scaling and interference with pigment production. Malassezia species, which are yeast, are the causative agents. The mode of transmission is endogenous as it's considered part of our normal flora. As far as our eyes are concerned, our tears are our best defense. They contain lysozyme and lactoferrin, which are antimicrobial substances. The flow of tears also helps to flush microbes and prevent them from attaching to the surface of the eye. Anything that impedes our vision would be problematic, and for this reason, inflammation does not occur in the eye. If we were to call all the lymphocytes in, it would block light from entering and blur our vision. Our eyes are immune-privileged sites which favor built-in defenses of the innate system. We now know that our eye has a wide variety of bacterial species present. The most common genus is Cornobacteria. Conjunctivitis is an inflammation of the conjunctiva, or the membrane that covers our eye. It could come from contaminants, from contacts, or from an eye injury. If conjunctivitis is caused by a bacteria, like Streptococcus pneumoniae, a milky discharge will be seen, along with the eye matted shut in the morning. Viral infections tend to cause a clear, watery discharge. Conjunctivitis is commonly known as pink eye. Neonatal conjunctivitis can be caused by Neisseria gonorrhea or chlamydia. 
The mode of transmission is vertical during delivery. If not treated with an antibiotic, it can lead to damage. Some other causative agents of conjunctivitis include bacteria like S. pyogenes, S. epidermidis, virus, fungi, and protozoans. The mode of transmission is by direct contact. In non-neonatal infections, broad-spectrum ciprofloxacin is prescribed. Keratitis is an infection in the deeper tissues of the eye and can lead to blindness. Bacteria, as well as herpes simplex virus, are causative agents. Oral HSV-1 may be reactivated and travel through the ophthalmic nerve. HSV-2 can also be transferred from the genital area to the eye. A clinical diagnosis can be made or with the help of PCR. Trifluoridine or acyclovir may be administered or both. Acanthamoeba keratitis occurs in individuals who wear contacts. It can be acquired from amoeba in tap water, lakes, or other bodies of water. It typically occurs when individuals are careless with contact hygiene or through trauma. This image is great because it outlines all of the diseases we discussed and depicts them by their types. Brown represents bacteria, green represents viruses, red represents protozoans, and blue represents fungal species. This will be a good study tool for you.